Cassie Carley was last seen on Sunday, March 27th, in the parking lot of Juana's Pagodas in Florida. She was picking up her daughter, Sailor, from Sailor's father, Marcus Spanavello. After days of searching, Cassie's body was found buried in a barn in Tennessee on Sunday, April 3rd. Spanavello has been arrested. everybody. Welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. I'm Christy Brower, here with my sister, co-host, and partner in crime, Katie Weaver. Hey, Katie. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Pretty well, you know, going pretty well. How are you doing? I'm good. I, um, you know, I'm back to this sunburned face again. You will think say, I will never you learn. like you've been at softball. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I did wear sunblock the second day. Uh, I don't know why I can't remember to wear it the first day, but you know, I, someone needs to take better care of their face, obviously. But anyway, other than that, I'm completely fine. We've been having 40 mile an hour winds today. Yeah. I just, um, Ugh. I don't know. It just makes me so nervous for my trees and, and my house. And, oh, right. Man, it's been awful today. It has. This is what Idaho does this time of year. To get all dried out and melt the snow real quick, we uh, we get these storms of several days of like 40, 50 mile an hour winds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> everything dries out real quick and the snow melts real quick. Um, yeah. Everything else really sucks, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I heard a story long. today about a woman who uh, whose trampoline got lifted up by the wind and it was headed straight for her daughter. So mom jumped in front of the trampoline <gasps> to sort of catch it to keep it from hitting her little girl. Oh no. Pulled her to the ground and broke her collarbone and bruised her ribs and oh, really no. beat her up. <laughs> like, She's a hero. Uh, she is. <laughs> Water was fine. Trampoline, however, did win the fight. Clearly. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is our Tuesday episode and we have a lot of good stuff to share with you today. I really so, do. Let's go ahead and get started, Katie, with some DNA for the win. You know, I used to wait for my letter from Hogwarts, but I'm done with that now because now I want to go to Western Michigan University. Oh. Because they have a brand new cold case program. Dude, what? And they are doing incredible things. So the cold case to... program, right? The cold case program just started last fall and they had decided to cover the case of a woman who was murdered in 1987. So it's about a 35 year old murderer. Mm -hmm. It's Roxanne Wood. She was found dead on the kitchen floor in her home after uh, a night out. She had been out bowling with her husband and friends. And then later that night was found dead on the kitchen floor. Uh, she had her throat cut. She'd been raped and stabbed multiple times. That is so and, weird because one of my childhood friends was named Roxanne Wood. <laughs> right. Yes. yes. I sort of went, what? Not yeah. the same Roxanne Wood, obviously. No, not, not the same one. But yeah, that, that is weird. Uh, at any rate, the case went cold. They had some suspects. Uh, they weren't ever able to put anything fully together. And the case went cold. So that's the case they decided to study. Mm -hmm. And they were given uh, from the police department literally everything. And their first job was to digitize the case. Mm -hmm. So they put together something like 1,200 hours of collective time in wow. digitizing the entire case, organizing all of the notes. They were also sure. given uh, access to the detectives to interview them, ask questions. The mm -hmm. detectives started uh, flipping uh, some stuff back to them, like, can you research this address or this, uh, you know, let me know what was going on in this area at the time. Like, they really started working incredibly well back and forth together. Mm -hmm. And one thing they did have was DNA. The DNA has been run through CODIS a few times with no results. Well, mm. now, as you know, we don't necessarily have to have uh, a direct match in CODIS 
to right. do uh, reverse genealogy. Yeah. And that's what they did. And so they were able to learn how to build a reverse family tree. And they were able to narrow it down to three brothers that would have lived in the area at the time. Well, guess what? One of those brothers, Patrick Wayne Gilham, was a suspect at the time. Oh, but they wow. They have never been able to get uh, enough Ooh. evidence to charge him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know what they did? They, the police, not the students, uh, they staked him out and watched him until they watched him flip a cigarette butt onto the ground. And they so many reasons not to throw your cigarette butts on the ground, um, yep. but this being definitely one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. They grabbed it and were able to get a match on the DNA and arrest him, and he admitted to it. Wow. So uh, first semester of the cold case class, uh, wildly successful, a huge DNA for the win, and, you know, he's actually still on the planet, so they're able to actually charge him. Boom. Yay. Isn't that That's amazing news? Yes. Yeah. I wanted to show you her picture. So this is Roxanne. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Girl. So, God. Right. So finally there's an answer in what happened to her. It's just amazing what they did and being able to use all their collective uh, gifts and skills and time you know, and able to uh, put together all of the evidence and get everything put together and then do the DNA work. It's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Gosh, that really yeah. is. But what a cool course to take and get to mm -hmm. be a part of helping find that murderer and solve yeah. this, solve this mystery. That is so well, interesting. They were able to be at the arraignment, you know, they'll be able to watch this march through court and sure. the evidence that they have collected and digitized and, you know, organized and made available to be used. It's just amazing. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Wow. So sorry, Hogwarts, you're out. These guys are in. <laughs> I'm down. Totally down. Yep. But I think there you have it. That That's an awesome DNA for the win. Yes, it is. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to kick the mic back over to you for our main case. Okay. I was starting to wonder. <laughs> <laughs> our main case today is missing and now we know murdered mother from uh, Florida, Cassie Carley. Yeah. And you may have been hearing about this case in the news. Um her body mm -hmm. was found over the weekend, but we, we wanted to cover what we know about this situation. And we're going to be keeping a close eye on it um, because it's just, frankly, it's awful, mm -hmm. but it's, um, it, it's a domestic violence case. And I, I feel like these are really important to cover mm -hmm. so that we, we bring more attention to these particular issues because they mm -hmm. are big ones. Well, and so that we continually remind women, yes, it can happen to you. Yeah. You know, and this wasn't Cassie Carley's fault in any way. Yeah. She did not cause this. She has been begging for help for years. Yes. But for the rest of you that also have, don't give up and don't let your guard down. No. Because this is where it's at. Yep. Absolutely. So Cassie, on March 27th, Cassie left her home where she lived with her dad to pick up her daughter, Sailor. Sailor was visiting her father, Marcus Spanavello, and Cassie was supposed to just run out, pick up Sailor, and come right back. Mm -hmm. uh, Cassie's dad was going to bed at the time. So mm -hmm. she just sort of stuck her head in and said, hey, I'm running to get Sailor. I'll be back, you know, and he went to bed. Mm -hmm. And when he woke up the next day, Cassie and Sailor were nowhere to be found. Yeah. She wasn't answering her phone. She wasn't answering text messages. Well, she was answering text messages in very weird ways. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that. We're going to share these texts because this um, is, a, is an important part of what happened here. Because these texts were not from Cassie. Mm -hmm. But they were sent from her phone. 
So this is a conversation that happens between Cassie's phone and her dad. And it says, uh, Cassie, I'm trying to call you. What's going on? And that was Sunday at 9.40 p.m. Oh, that's right. So he did try to text her before he went to bed. Mm -hmm. um, so then he texts her again. I'm freaking out, Case. Call me uh, as soon as you can, as soon as you get this message. So later she gets, she texts back or her phone texts back. I'm sorry, car was acting up and I broke my phone. Marcus is working on it. I will stay at his place tonight. He is paying me money to do some stuff around his house. Uh, which the history between these two, there's no way she would do that. She was afraid of him. Mm -hmm. She did not. She often didn't do the exchanges for her daughter alone because yeah. um, she was of afraid his of him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she had been telling her family for years, if anything ever happens to me, it will be Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. So dad is immediately like, what? And so he asks, are you in PCB? What does PCB stand for? Uh, I assume that was their town. I guess so. I'm not 100% sure. Um, so then she texts back, no, the screen is jumping all over the place. Let me see if he can get this fixed and I'll call you. I'm going to sleep. I just needed to know my girls were all right. So next morning, where are you, Sister Sledge? Yeah. So dad realizes something is way off when he wakes up and mm -hmm. she's not home. Her daughter is not there. Like Sailor's four. Like yeah. mom isn't just going to disappear with right. Sailor. So he reports them missing to the police. Mm-hmm. Police, unfortunately, wait a little while to react. And we see yeah. this, you know, that whole idea, well, she's an adult. She can do what she wants. You know, it's, it's so frustrating. And this is um, with uh, uh, Naomi Irion, the, mm -hmm. the family. They have a hashtag. What's it called? Um, listen to the family. Uh, trust the family. Trust the family. Trust the family. Because there are so many cases like this where police wait mm -hmm. because, you know, they, they're, well, they're an adult, blah, blah, blah. But their families are like, yes, but we know them. And mm -hmm. they never, you know, don't respond. And they right. never just disappear. Like, this is way out of character. And right. it's like, the law enforcement just doesn't want to listen to that. Right. You know, they just treat every single case the same mm -hmm. when you've got family members going, look, we hear from her every day. Like mm -hmm. there's no, yeah. she would she never lives just here. do this. Yeah. yeah. She lives here. Yeah. Like she would never just do this and leave me hanging. Mm -hmm. She's never done that before. Like, right. I don't know why they can't hear those kinds of things. It's asinine. It's, it, it reads as, I don't want to have to deal with this. It so does. I'm going very to just brush you off. Like, I'm hoping this is just an adult who left their life. You know, mm -hmm. we hear that all the time. Well, she probably just decided to leave and start over. Yeah. What? People don't just do that. That's a, no, would be an extremely rare event. It we, would. Yeah. Marcus also, uh, or sorry, Cassie's dad also had a text exchange with Marcus. It's pretty yes. interesting. Yes. Yeah. I have that. Okay, here, I'll bring that up. Oh, you got it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he had been trying to uh, call him. Yeah. And and so he texted, why do you keep calling me? And Cassie's dad said, I haven't heard from Cassie. Is she with you? Yeah. No, she was out of her mind last night. Oh, of course. Yeah, First I'm sure. was her car not working, and then her phone had an issue and asked me to see if I could fix. As I'm trying to see what's wrong, she keep getting mad like I was trying to look at her text messages, then asked for a ride home. As we were getting close, she changed her mind because you would flip out if you see her like that. Then asked me to drop her off. I don't know, Stacy, I think. But I, oh, but don't want to tell me where the place is because I could go after Stacy. And asked me to just drop her off in the middle of nowhere in Destin with that late in the night with Sailor. I told her I wouldn't let Sailor go like that. And she flipped out and I left with Sailor. If she wants Sailor back next weekend, she will have to drive to me. 
So mm -hmm. then dad says, Stacy moved to Alabama a while ago. <laughs> Cassie would never have you drop her off anywhere. Is her car at your house? And then he says, I'm not good with names. I'm not sure if it was Stacy. Either way, she didn't want to give me an address of a place to drop her off. Why would you, my car be, or why would her car be at my house? And then he said, where did you exchange Sailor? Where is her car? And he said, Navarre. And that's where, uh, that, that's where she lived was Navarre. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so he's, you know, dad's reaching out from both phones and he's texting back to him uh, on both phones, trying to right. put this narrative together of, well, you know, and she was crazy and out of her mind. And yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's very much a domestic violence thing to say. Mm -hmm. Also, in the brief time she went to just meet him and get her daughter, her car broke down and she broke her phone. Right. And then she flipped out. Was totally no. out of her mind. No, none of those things happen. We all know they did. We all have known guys mm -hmm. like this guy mm -hmm. who say shit like that mm -hmm. in hopes of getting someone to believe them. And, you know, this time it didn't work. Um, unfortunately, it was too late for Cassie. Yeah. But his story has not held up at all. No. So her car is found um, at Juanes Pagodas in Navarre Beach on the 29th. So two days after she went missing. Her purse was in the car. Yeah. And like her credit cards hadn't been used. Nothing had been used. And it's all in the car. Like that was the police immediately went, yeah, this is not going to end well. Except, of course, for her phone. Yes, because we know who had that. Mm -hmm. So then on the 30th, and see, all this time, Sailor is missing. Mm -hmm. He says to Dad that he has Sailor, but we don't know. We don't know where he is. Right. Right. So on March 30th, they find him in Birmingham, Alabama, and he has Sailor. Mm-hmm. So Sailor was taken by um, Alabama Child Services because at this point they don't know what the hell's going on, but they don't think that she's safe with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at that point, they believe that Spanavela was the last person to see Cassie before she went missing. Yeah. So yeah. then on March 31st, the FBI get involved. Mm -hmm. um, the FBI gets involved in cases like this when there are children involved and when they go across state lines. So that's why the yeah. feds are involved. Yes. Um, they announce a $3,000 reward for information about Cassie. Mm -hmm. And the police do um, put out a statement that they don't know what happened to her. Um, but and we don't have any evidence specifically pointing to homicide or abduction. We just know uh, the way she's gone missing concerns us greatly, is what mm -hmm. the uh, sheriff said. Yeah. So at least we know at this point that Sailor is okay. Yes. Um, so then on April 2nd, Marcus Spanavelo was arrested in Tennessee. We've got three states going on now. Mm -hmm. um, and he's re arrested on three charges. Um, let's see, tampering with evidence, giving false information concerning a missing person, and investigation and destruction of evidence. Mm -hmm. So this has, I'm sure, to do with the phone and the texts mm -hmm. that um, went on there. So he's arrested and taken into custody. Um, on April 3rd, the police announced that they did find Cassie's body. Yeah. In um, in Alabama, mm -hmm. buried in a shallow grave inside a barn. Mm -hmm. Now, on a barn, farm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, it, it has to do with Marcus's work, right? Mm -hmm. That he has links to it. Because, I, I mean, it's pretty amazing that they found her that quickly buried inside a barn in a different mm -hmm. state, you know, in Tennessee. Um, but that, that yeah. was linked to what, his work. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently the sheriff was uh, walking around just, you know, giving it another, giving it a good look to just see if anything seemed out of place. 
and he saw in the barn that some of the dirt in there seemed like it was disturbed huh. and that's yep. what led to it and they identified her by a tattoo on her foot yep we yeah. don't know cause of death we don't really know injuries no. there was an autopsy to Today. be held on monday yeah, yeah but we we don't know anything yet on yeah. on that but um and Spanavelo is has not been charged with her death yet. He's no. still sitting on those charges. So mm -hmm. you were telling me earlier something that happened in court today. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So he was in court today. The judge asked him if he, uh, you know, is going to uh, waive extradition because obviously they're trying to extradite him back to Florida. And of yeah. course, no, he's not. He's going to be a difficult dick, you know, of course. Mm -hmm. And he said that there were some things that needed to be taken care of before he even thought about that. And then he said to the judge, I need to make sure that my daughter is safe with whoever the people are taking care of her. I oh, mean, come on. Take a jackass. few seats. Are you kidding? Me? Yeah. Yeah. The judge literally did not even address that comment at all. Good. He said, he said, well, then we'll see you back here on April 13th. And he kind of reiterated again something about his daughter. And the judge said, okay, well, we'll just see you back here on April 13th. <laughs> like He's like, I'm not talking to you about this. I'm not playing. Are you kidding me right now? Right. Like, I'm not, I'm not going there. So now Florida will have to really start the whole extradition process. It takes a little bit of time, but they will get him back to uh, Florida where they'll you know, dive deeper. But yeah, obviously, uh, three states involved, the FBI is involved. It's, mm -hmm. it's a mess. But well, and Sailor is still the little one is safe. Yes, yeah. she's still in custody with child protection in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to work then with um, Cassie's family to get mm -hmm. her back home. It's a, this has become very complicated because of all of the crossing state lines mm -hmm. stuff. It's going to take a little time. Mm -hmm. to figure out what is going on here. But, you know, yeah. Cassie has struggled with this, with him as long as they've had a child together. Mm -hmm. Like she has been afraid of him, has always felt like he was dangerous to her mm -hmm. and yet has not been able to get any help. No, he's actually, she's actually had to have the police force him to return sailor to her before mm -hmm. because he took her once and wouldn't give her back for two weeks until they yeah. finally we able to get the courts and the police involved to get her back. Yep. But this is, this is scary, scary stuff. Yep. And it's such a sad outcome for her and her family and yeah. for little sailor who has now lost her mom and her dad. Yep. Yep. Luckily mom has a very loving family. Yes. She's got a very supportive sister and dad. And, and you know, brother. there are lots of people yeah. in her life that care about her and care about sailor. Mm -hmm. And so they'll see this through. Yeah. But it's, you know, one huge problem we have, and, and I've seen it all over the country. And definitely when I worked in domestic violence here is this problem of the danger to mom when she is trying to, um, you know, transfer a child back and forth for visitation mm -hmm. It's, it's one of the most dangerous times in a, a domestic violence situation mm -hmm. because she has no choice but to give dad access to her personally. Yeah. And that is so scary. It's why we need, you know, visitation centers and drop-off centers. And, you know, there are domestic violence programs that actually provide that service yeah. where mom can come in and drop off the child. The staff there watch the kid until dad gets there so that their paths do not cross. Yeah. But... I mean, we don't have nearly enough help no. with things like that. And a case like this just highlights how important that those kinds of services are for yeah. women who have been victims of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Absolutely. Yep. It's a really, really sad case. We've been watching it unfold over this whole last week. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so grateful that that sheriff thought to peek in that barn and just happened oh to gosh. see that dirt. And if he hadn't, uh, who knows? Who knows? I mean, that that kind of burial, I mean, she could have been missing for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for and sure. There's been great help and great action on this once it started. 
Mm -hmm. But again, we should have started sooner. Got to stop with this shit about, well, she probably just went off somewhere. No, she has a four-year-old child. She lives with her dad. She was starting a new job. I mean, look at the circumstances around her life. She was not in a position to just disappear. No. Oh, I get so frustrated with that attitude mm-hmm. when you've got family who she lives with and family who she sees every day who mm-hmm. are saying, this is not like her. This is wrong. Something is wrong. These policies have to change. Yeah. Yep. And uh, trust out. trust the family. Na- Naomi Arion's family had it right. Trust mm-hmm. the family. Yep. People know, you know, that they're close to. Yeah. Waiting does nothing but just seal people's death warrants, you know? Yeah. And I'm not saying that this would have saved her because I suspect that she was killed very quickly, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it can, you know? Right. Right. Uh, Well, that is what we know on Cassie Carly right now. And we will continue to update this case and we may have more information on Wednesday night case updates. I would imagine we do. There may be cause of death out by then, but then again, who knows? They may keep that uh, autopsy pretty close to this cop, too. We don't know. We'll find out. Where it's a part of a murder investigation a lot of times. But they may say, like, cause of death. But that might be, yeah. uh, that may be all we get for yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, that's very possible. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, Katie, I hear you have some WTF news for us as well. Oh, do I? Yes. <laughs> All righty. Well, I'm going to give you a peek at uh, this lady right here. Yikes. Mm, yeah. Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a dark energy around this person. <laughs> right? <laughs> it seems like it, right? This mm-hmm. is Nancy Brophy. Nancy Brophy is a romance novelist uh, from Oregon. And uh, she's written a lot. She had quite a written quite a few books over the years. Uh, Mm -hmm. Back in 2011, in an uh, application to get into a writer's guild, she wrote an essay called How to Murder Your Husband. Oh, dear. Well, Uh, is that what we call a giant red flag? (laughs) Not sure if that just started somebody's wheels a turning or if they already had been. Mm -hmm. But in 2018, Nancy was charged with, well, murdering her husband. Wow. In Portland, Oregon, and she her trial has just started. So it's an interesting peek at what's going on in this case. So what the prosecution says, he was uh, a chef and worked at a culinary school. Mm-hmm. And he got to school one morning uh, early before any students were there and was doing his prep work for the day. And he was shot twice. Oh, wow. And was found in a pool of blood and Mm. the prosecution says that nancy's minivan was seen on you know various cameras in the area driving to the school right around the same time that he would have been killed boy they're also saying that there was a very large life insurance policy the typical wow not very subtle is nancy no and a lot of other uh, like pension and retirement type things that she would have benefited from as well. At the time, they were in a financial disaster mm-hmm. and were fighting to not lose their house. And yet they were paying about $1,000 a month into a life insurance policy and retirement plans for him. Whew which uh, prosecutors found to be very odd considering that they were in such a bad financial place that they were keeping this stuff up. Right. That would be the stuff you would let go if you couldn't pay your house payment. You'd think. think. Also, she and Daniel Brophy had a marriage ceremony, a big event in 1997, but never actually filed a marriage certificate until, can you imagine when? Shortly before he was murdered. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Oh, she just was setting the whole thing up. Mm-hmm. I wonder if he had any awareness that something was off. I can't imagine. 
Now, of course, the defense attorney says that uh, her finances have gone to hell since the killing and that uh, this idea that she was going to make all of this money is a complete farce. But that's, of course, not what the prosecutor says. These are things we'll have to uh, certainly have to learn uh, as this plays out. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, her uh, the defense attorneys say this is a circumstantial case. And it asks you to cast a blind eye to the most powerful evidence of all, love. <laughs> oh, whatever. Her client had no reason to kill her husband. She said he was a great listener, a wonderful lover, and a consummate chef and true life partner. Well. Yeah, okay, Nancy. Part of the issue. That, that sounds like what a romance novelist would say, doesn't right? it? <laughs> what I thought too. Like you said that in court. Oh. <laughs> yeah. A wonderful lover. Okay. Settle down, lady. You're both like 70, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh the detective said there was no sign of robbery. Uh his wallet, keys, phone, everything was totally left untouched. He was just murdered. There was nothing stolen from the school. There was no sign of a break in. Just like someone wow. just walked right in there who knew the joint and just shot and killed him and walked right back out. Yeah, like someone who just wanted him dead, clearly. Mm -hmm. yeah, There's it's... never been another suspect. She goes by Crampton Brophy, Brophy too, by the way. Nancy Brophy is her name, but I, apparently she goes by Crampton. Anyway. Yeah. Is, that, is that her pen name? Maybe. I'm not sure. This article uh, and the other articles I've seen name her as both Crampton mm -hmm. and Nancy. So I guess if you hear either of those names, it's still the same, uh, the same uh, uh, wild lady here. So. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's where things are at. The other part of the evidence that I thought was so interesting is that uh, she, he was killed with a Glock pistol that she purchased at a Portland gun show. And she's but not covered her tracks here at all. She also bought a ghost gun assembly kit online. Mm. But uh looked like she didn't actually have maybe the skills to put that gun together. But uh -huh. she also had bought a replacement barrel that she did put on the Glock. Oh. So that has made it harder to, uh, according to the prosecution, at least made it harder to... Uh, track the uh, forensic evidence back to her, but they mm -hmm. have proof that she bought the ghost gun assembly kit as well as the uh, replacement barrel. Ah. She says that she bought both of those things because she was researching a novel. Yet again, something a romance novelist would probably say. Right. I mean, that's easy to say. <laughs> yep. Does does this murder follow the essay she wrote at all? I I don't know. It has it was not deemed admissible in court, uh -huh. so it they don't get to present it. I haven't actually read it. I I'm hoping it's online somewhere, but I haven't had a chance to look for it. But uh, I'm gonna yeah. guess that if this were graded, she would get an F because uh, right? she has done a real bad job of keeping herself out of the line of fire here. Well, when the ghost gun assembly kit got to their house, she was traveling for work. And guess who signed for it? Poor oh, Daniel. God, that's but terrible. Again, she, and, and maybe she did order things, you know, and, and purchase things and stuff to research for books from time to time. I don't know. It's possible. But at any rate, it's, uh, it's something else. Boy, yeah. that is. Uh, the other thing that the uh, defense attorney said, and you're totally right, this is all stuff that sounds just like what the uh, romance novelist would say. Nancy has always been thoroughly, madly, crazily in love with Dan Brophy, and she remains so to this day. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Get real. Yeah. Yes. So, again, the uh, How to Murder Your Husband essay is not admissible. Oh, I just found it. Yes, I do have it. Ooh. Okay. I'll put a link to it in the uh, show files in case you guys want to find it and read it. But uh, you can yeah, see it do. That interesting stuff. So I'm we're just going to keep an eye. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, me too. So we'll keep an eye on this, uh, you know, case as it marches through court and keep you guys abreast of it in case updates. But uh, as far as, uh, you know, WTF crime goes, I thought this one uh, definitely hit the mark. It definitely does. Yes. Thank you for that. You bet. So this is our Tuesday episode. We will be back tomorrow with another brand new episode and we'll be back uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Mountain for case updates. Uh, it's our live stream on YouTube and Facebook mm -hmm. and we will be back on Thursday night for a live stream at 7 p.m. Mountain that is our psychic hour and it is the first Thursday of the month so we will be doing marching orders by sun sign so a reading yep. for every sun sign for the month of April so so much more great content to come so mm -hmm. please like, subscribe, share, do your thing, comment, you know, whatever. If you're going to be nice, if you're not, see ya. <laughs> Keep on scrolling if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it. We are True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. Thanks for being here. Take care. <laughs>